Hey there. As you're learning Android development, or really any other type of software development, staying up to date is one of the biggest challenges. I get questions about that all the time from developers I talk to at many different stages of their career. I recently did a live stream and we had a lot of great Q&A around this exact topic. And so in this video, I've cut together a number of those questions and responses and the, just the general discussion in hopes of helping you maybe better think about how you can stay up to date throughout your career and learning process. Now, just real quick, if you're new to this channel, my name is Nate, and this channel is dedicated to building great software and helping others do the same. So if you wanna be up to date on future tools and tips and advice for your software development career, click the subscribe button down below. Now let's jump over to the Q&A. And the first question that I got this past week that I wanna talk about is, how do you stay up to date? And I mean, I think this is a pretty prominent question. I think a lot of us uh, struggle with this. I know I do. That's probably one of my biggest challenges um, in my kind of day to day as a software developer, um, even, you know, seven years or so into my professional career as a software developer. So I think this is a worthwhile question for us to explore. So the first thing that I'll point out when we can think about how to try and uh, learn it all, how to stay up to date, is don't try to learn it all. Uh, software in general is moving so fast that it is impossible these days to try and learn it all. Uh, more focused to the world of Android, um, it's, it's still very much true. If we think about how fast Android is changing, every week almost we're getting new updates to Android X and uh, Jetpack libraries. We're getting updates with Kotlin. Uh, new patterns are coming out, um, new devices are coming out and bringing with it uh, form factors and things that we have to update. Uh, every year we're getting new features in the Android framework that we want to try and stay up to date with and support for our users. All of that adds up to really too much for any one person to stay up to date on. Um, and that's why often you, you, you don't have a lot of people that are really out there working on the entirety of the Android framework. Even people uh, at Google that many of us might be looking to for advice and mentorship and whatnot are very specific on one area. And if you talk to a lot of them, they'll even say if they had to sit down and write an app today, they might not know where to start because they're so focused in on one area. And I think that's true for a lot of us. So when you're thinking about how you wanna stay up to date, maybe reframe it a little bit and don't worry so much about staying up to date on everything, but being able to maybe focus in on a few specific things. And so that kind of brings me to my next point here is when you're thinking about what you want to focus in on and what you want to learn, focus on just trying to learn what you need when you need to learn it. Now, what do I mean here? Um, for example, let's say you've heard a little bit about the Android navigation library. If you don't have a use case for that right away, say in a personal project or even better uh, at work, if you are already working as a developer, then you might not need to focus on learning the Android navigation component right away. What you can do is focus on uh, working on whatever it is that you actually need at the time. If you are on a project and you need to come up across a new library or a new architectural pattern um, or a new testing framework or something like that, that is the best time, I think, to really jump in and dive deep and learn uh, these new frameworks. Now you can stay up to them, or excuse me, you can stay up to date with them, uh, be aware of what's out there so that when you need to go and pick a new tool, you know where it's at. And I think that's a really good way to kind of maximize your learning and to not get too overwhelmed. So staying focused in on what you need for the current task at hand and learning things as you need them. So the next point I wanna make in regards to how do you stay up to date is to not just learn what you need when you need it, but also once in a while, try and learn what's interesting to you. And the reason I point out trying to learn what's interesting to you is because I think it's really valuable for us to stay excited and to stay motivated. And one great way to do that is to build things and learn about things that we are excited about. So for me, I, I really like looking uh, into things related to Kotlin and I like looking at architecture. So sometimes for me, I have a lot of fun 
just uh, building up a sample project and trying to see how I can utilize new features, new method calls, uh, work on maybe a new architectural pattern. For some people, they might really be interested in accessibility and in understanding how to better support that for their users. So anything you have like that, maybe it's, maybe it's a game, uh, maybe you want to build like a text-based adventure game on Android or even at the command line. It doesn't always have to be related to whatever your main focus is. But if you can take some time away and learn the things that really excite you, that'll help motivate you to learn the other things that you need as well. And I think that can be incredibly valuable when you think about uh, having longevity in your career and staying excited and not burning out as you're going on. So Ethan asks, when coding as an Android developer, how do you decide on implementing new things or sticking with the old? Um, so there's probably a couple of different ways this could be taken, but I, I'm, so I'm assuming like, how do you decide on whether to um, make maybe re refactor, or like use in new and existing tools versus sticking with what you know? Um, and that is, like, that is a good question. I think that's always kind of a, it's a balance that we have to make. Um, I think as developers, we tend to be curious. And so a lot of times we want to go and try and explore the new things. But we also, I think, should be pragmatic to some extent. And so we want to make sure that we're using tools that we're familiar with and we know work and are stable and all of that. So it is a balance. And I think this balance, in some ways, is going to be informed by the team and the organization that you're in. If you're working at a startup, there's likely going to be a lot more leeway um, and room for you to try new and exciting things because there's probably going to be a little less formality, probably smaller team as well. So it's easier to be really fast and try those new things, to rewrite things as you go. That's kind of just the nature of being on a small kind of startup team. On the flip side, if you're in a really large established company or maybe just a company that moves a bit slower, it's going to be harder to do that. Um, I've been on both teams. I've been on a team where we could pull in the newest libraries and everything as often as we wanted. Um, and I was on a team where we would have to get like approval for such things. And we had to really talk to like all the devs on the team and get buy-in before we tried something new. So, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is to, you know, check in with the team, see how other people on the team are feeling. Um, and also, you know, I, th I think it's good to, you know, stay up to date and try and bring new things in where you see fit but also recognize that we do want to make sure our applications are stable and reliable. So um, I can give an example of my own experience of what maybe not to do. Um, when Work Manager came out, uh, we tried to, we, we integrated Work Manager when it was still in alpha, and that ended up being a huge uh, mistake. You know, we had tried a couple of the other libraries in alpha and they'd worked fine, but Work Manager, we ran into a huge bug led to tons of crashes for our user and it took several releases to fix it. Like even the Google engineers that we were working with to help us, like they kept having to give us new fixes because there was just this really nasty bug. So in that sense, like we probably should have been a little bit more cautious, not been so eager to try the new thing and waited till it to be a little bit more stable. So um, I would say that's the advice, you know, try and balance, you know, the needs of your, your users, your consumers with your desire to try the new stuff. And, and last thing on this, I guess, is, but, you know, if you're in a sample project, it doesn't matter. If you're in a little sample project or a personal project, I would say try anything and everything you want. But if you're building an application for people, keep in mind the stability um, and the user experience, for sure. That's a good question. That's something we all deal with all the time. Um, okay, yeah, so I think that's roughly what we answer here. So with new libraries in Kotlin, when do you stop inventing new language speakers and libs, and where do you decide... A should evolve your code base. Um, so I think the, the evolution of the code base is something that you want to try and kind of have going at all the time. So as you as you're coming back to a feature, maybe think about, you know, how can I clean this code up a bit? You know, how can I prove this here and there? Is it time to maybe apply a new pattern here? Um, again, it takes it, it takes, you know, checking in with your team to see what level of time and effort you can put into something, what level of risk is acceptable to do a big refactor versus like the small update. Uh, but in general, I think as we go through a code base, a good rule of thumb is to try and leave the code cleaner, uh, more stable, better tested than when we found it. So sometimes that might mean refactoring an entire screen and updating from scratch. 
But oftentimes that might mean small little incremental changes as we go. And each time you touch a file, if you can make it a little bit better, then over time, the quality of the code base will improve as well. All right, uh, Rakib asks, uh, how do you approach keeping up with new frameworks and practices when you're busy at work on a relatively older, more rigid project at work while minimizing time spent coding outside of work? Uh, yes, so that is, I mean, that goes perfectly back to the question of how do you stay up to date that we were talking about at the beginning? Um, you know, how do you approach keeping up with the new frameworks practices when you're busy working on kind of an older project? So I think the expectation here is that if it's an older project, you're probably not getting opportunities to work on those, those new things and implement them as a part of the project. So that makes it harder to learn the things as you go. Um, and then you also, you wanna spend, or you wanna protect the time that you spend outside of work. We don't uh, want to spend all of our time coding all the time. And, and we shouldn't have to, like, you shouldn't have to be working, you know, 80 hours a week between home and work to stay up to date. Um, and so, I mean, the first thing I would say here is, is again, you know, sometimes we can like reevaluate what it means to stay up to date, like how many things we're actually actively using and trying. Because again, because so much stuff's coming out, we often feel overwhelmed, um, especially, you know, if you go to a conference and you see 20 talks about all these new things, it makes it feel like everybody is out there learning all these things, um, which is not the case. So in some sense, I think we can give ourselves a little bit of freedom to not always be so up to date. I think that's perfectly okay. Um, another thing that I think is good to do, um, you know, maybe the viability probably depends a little bit on the team, but I think it's very valid and reasonable as an engineer to carve into your work week time to stay up to date on things. So, you know, like some of the bigger companies, they might be the idea of like 20% time where you 20% of your week, you can spend doing, you know, a, a side project or learning a new thing or working on something else. That's something that I've tried to kind of build into my work just in general. Um, I think, you know, at certain points, I've sort of had conversations with managers about, hey, you know, is it okay that I do this? I think as I've grown um, in my career, been in my career for longer, it's something that I've just started to carve out for myself. Um, even if it's just a couple hours a week, scheduled into my regular work time. Um, and that might be a, like a sample project or a little sandbox app, or just I can take a little bit of time, work on implementing a new thing, work on pulling in a new library, playing with a testing approach, things like that. Um, I, I think that's a, a nice, happy medium. It's a way to avoid too much time outside of work, um, but also a way to make sure that you have that learning time if you're not getting it so much in the actual project and the code that you're working on. Um, if, if you have questions about whether that would be okay, I think having that conversation with a manager is a great idea. Hopefully that manager is going to see that value and be very okay with that. Um, and if they are, and they do give you that approval, then that gives you sort of that free pass to feel very comfortable in that. Um, that's kind of what I did in my very first job out of school. And it ended up working out great for everybody because I was able to learn new things and then bring them back to the team and then the team was able to better utilize those. So that could be one way for you to pitch it. You could, um, you know, sh tell them or mention to them how you, by you learning, it's going to improve the team and you can maybe see where best practices or things like that can be updated. Um, but yeah, that's a challenge. Uh, you know, good luck with that. I I'd love to hear what other people are doing for this? How are they staying up to date? How are they carving out that time during the week to stay up to date on this stuff? So this week, the question is just, what's the biggest challenge in software development for you right now? What is the thing that's been hard? What are you trying to overcome? I think for me lately, the big challenge has been, um, again, trying to like manage uh, the things that I really am interested in personally and how to blend that with what I'm currently working on at, at work. Um, it's not to say I don't like what I'm working on at work, it's just it's a little bit different. And so like we mentioned in some of the questions earlier, like how can you carve out that space? It, it can be a challenge, especially when you have, you know, life, you maybe, maybe you're trying to exercise and stay mentally and physically fit, spend time with, you know, a significant other, your, your dog, your pets, your friends, all that. It, it is challenging. And so that's kind of been my struggle is just making sure I'm keeping everything in balance while also developing my technical skills as an engineer. So is there a good place to learn all the different stuff and when to use them? Uh, I talk about MVVM, 
Oh, let's throw that back up one more time. Um, I'm talking about MVVM and the other acronyms. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's one single place. So the, the so the one place that comes to mind for MVVM and some of the other like UI architecture patterns specifically. So that's things like MVVM, MVP, MVI, MVC. Um, there is a Google repo that walks through some of these architecture blueprints. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, Google Arch Blueprints. Uh, okay, yeah, I think I found it here. So yeah, so this repo here um, called Android slash architecture samples. Um, yeah, the, I believe if this is the one I'm thinking of, it has a bunch of different branches here. Uh, yeah, so it has a, different branches representing different ways of sort of building your Android app. So, um, you know, as we see, we have examples here for how to implement Dagger Android, uh, you know, data binding, um, MVVM with live data, MVVM with Rx Java. Um, let's see, what else we have in here? Some to do's for like MVP examples. Um, so that at least covers MVP and MVVM. Um, it doesn't cover all of them, the, those are probably, you know, two of the top three uh, that I hear talked about right now. For MVI, um, I don't know of like a really good place for MVI, although there are some pretty good talks out there from conferences the last couple years. Um, DroidCon Boston 2019 had a couple good talks on it. Um, I think there was one at uh, Android Summit, uh, not Android Dev Summit, but just Android Summit um, from last August. Um, so that's probably an okay place to start learning more about MVI. Um, man, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Um, maybe if I, if I remember, I'll try and leave, like, leave a comment later down in, below in the comments. But um, yeah, it, it is kind of hard to find like a single resource to learn all of these different patterns. Um, and I also, I guess, I'll point out too, like when we think about MVVM, it's really just the UI layer, like how to get sort of like combine the data and put it into the UI. So there's also just larger architecture as a whole, like how do we manage, you know, A-B tests? How is our authentication flows? How are we gonna navigate between screens? How are we gonna collect um, or like have account data? How are we gonna store things in our database? There's all these other parts that go into the architecture as well. Uh, some of those larger things you could also start to, um, you know, understand and learn a bit more about from this architecture samples repo. Uh, that Google has, because they do talk about some of that stuff. Um, and then also uh, just general, you know, another general good resource, uh, but the book Clean Code, um, which you can find on Amazon. Um, this is another one that I think a lot of people look to in ways of like structure um, and kind of architect their code bases. Um, very good resource there that, you know, a lot of people tend to recommend. So. Uh, yeah, there's kind of a lot of different places out there, unfortunately. I don't know if there's one like a great resource to just learn everything. Um, and honestly, it, like that would be that would be really challenging. Um, maybe the closest thing to that we've had is Udacity's like Android program. But even that really didn't get much into things like MVVM or MVP. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of a hard problem right now, unfortunately. Another question uh, from Rakib here. So regarding Android development, have you been at a crossroads where you wanted to specialize on build engineering, UI, or just continue with app development? What has helped clarify this? Um, so yeah, I think in my career, I've gone through multiple sort of diff different uh, states where like f for a long time, I really wanted to, so you really focused on like the UI. I, I really loved, you know, trying to like, make things look great. So this was right around when uh, material design came out. So like UI was really fresh and exciting. So I really wanted to see like, how can we implement this new material design guideline? How can we make things visually appealing? How can we make it easier for engineers to implement these UI designs? How can we add animation? Um, so like there was a while where like I was really focused in on that. Um, I think there was another, well, actually currently I'm sort of in this period where I've been really into like uh, the build systems, uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment. How do we automate tasks and make kind of the that process of just continually shipping good uh, software easier and more seamless? Um, and so I think like it's really common for us to go through those phases. And so like I don't I don't know if I have a lot of like hard advice here other than 
you know, if you find yourself really gravitating one way or the other, I don't think there's anything wrong with you to lean into that. If you really want to be like a UI focused developer, um, I don't think there's an issue with that, um, particularly if you still, you know, know how to build an application. I think that's like the one risk that we have is if we go so far into one area that we no longer know kind of enough to like actually sit down and build a simple app. Um, I don't think we have to know at all times how to build like a complicated app, but I think of like if you're sitting down in an interview and had to do a take home test and, and a lot of times those take home tests are basically here's a weather API. How do you pull today's weather or data from the API and show it in a list and then maybe have a detailed view. If you can keep that in your mind, uh, which isn't too hard to do, then yeah, focus on things, focus on builds, focus on CI, testing, UI. Those are actually great ways to help differentiate yourself when looking for jobs. Um, and it's also a great way, you know, if you want to give talks or blog posts or things like that, which again, can then help you, um, you know, get your name out there and get jobs and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think specializing can be great. Um, and again, it goes back to what I talked about at the beginning. If you really are interested in something like UI and like material design, um, spending time on that is going to get you excited and it's going to help keep you motivated and help avoid burnout, which is awesome. So Hamza here asks, what skills are expected from junior and senior Android developers? Um, yeah, this is a great question. So I think this is going to depend a little bit on, you know, again, the, the team, the organization. Um, for me, like when I've hired in the past, uh, I've been looking at, at the junior level, I've been looking for someone that they, they know kind of the core fundamentals of Android. They, they know what an activity is. They know what a fragment is. They, they kind of know what, what the manifest is used for. Um, they have a general idea of sort of like what goes into, you know, like your, your Gradle files. Um, they can explain to me, you know, how I might start to think about building a very simple UI. How am I going to get button clicks? How am I going to navigate from one screen to the next? Um, you know, what, what is an intent? And maybe, you know, what are different types of intents? And, you know, an, an explicit intent versus an implicit intent. Um, you know, how, how is one, like, how might you go about uh, performing work on the background thread? You know, what is an ANR um, uh, kind of... It, what was an AR issue in your app and how would you go about diagnosing that? What, what might that mean? Um, you know, those are the types of questions, you know, basically things that show that you've actually been working with Android for a while, things that you should run into pretty quickly if you try building a simple app. Um, and then like if I'm doing a take home test for like a junior level developer, I, I would expect someone to be able to, you know, take, uh, you know, make an API request show that data in like a simple recycler view and then probably navigate to another screen. Um, it wouldn't have to look great. It wouldn't necessarily have to be architected really well, but like that's the type of functionality that I would expect for like a junior level. Um, now at the senior level, um, what I would expect is, you know, we're gonna, you're gonna start wanting having more of those like architecture patterns in place. So if you go back to that same example, you know, we might have the same uh, requirements but the um, the level of like architecture and the, the cleanness of the code would be much better. I would expect people to be able to tell me why they implemented things a certain way, uh, why you chose maybe Rx Java over live data, or why you choose Flow over Rx Java, things like that. Um, at the senior level, I would expect to be able to have a conversation around you know testing and testing approaches and how to make our code more testable. Um, you know, I might expect to be able to have a conversation around you know, CI or the build system, you know, some things maybe more specific to the types of things they've talked about specializing in on their resume. Um, you know, at, at a senior level, I think being able to give more depth. So instead of a question like how might you do work on a background thread, it might be, you know, what are multiple ways you can do work on a background thread and what are the pros and cons? Like when would you want to just spin up a new thread to do some work versus when would you want to use work manager? Um, what would be the pros and cons of integrating Rx Java into your code base? Um, you know, what, how might you go about diagnosing a very tricky bug? How would you go about implementing an A-B test? All, all of these things, kind of that next level of what goes into really taking an app from a viable, sustainable, maintainable product. Those are the types of things that I would, that I would start to expect a lot more of at that, that mid and senior level. 
Let's see, uh, Benny here asks, what would you say are three main things Android Dev has to know, like unit test or DI? Um, oh man, that's a, that's a good question. It's so hard because there's so many things. Um, three main things. So on, honestly, like you mentioned like unit test or DI, like those are vile, like those are good things. And maybe up at like that senior level, those could start to be like another list. Um, but like at the very basics, I think, um, just how, like, how do you build like a UI? How do you get different types of things on the screen? Um, you know, how do I show like a list of data? How do I, um, compose a UI in certain ways? Like, I think there's a lot that goes into that and how to do that efficiently. Um, how to use like constraint layout, for example, I think would be a big benefit for that these days. How do you navigate between screens, um, uh, properly? How do you kind of structure, going from an activity to an activity, or how do you go from fragment to a fragment and kind of when to use one or the other, what are the trade-offs? Um, and then I think like, how do, how do you do work on a background thread? I think that's another like very critical one. And what are some of the different ways to do that? And again, what are the trade-offs for those? You know, I think those are sort of like the three things that like, as soon as you jump into building a real app, like those are the things you run into. Um, now, like kind of the next level after that, I do think unit testing is huge. Um, having even like a really basic understanding of how to write a simple unit test, I think that is like really important and, you know, people should at least understand that uh, and then start to build on that as you go. Uh, dependency injection is a good one. Um, I, I don't like all the, the arguments that people get into over dependency injection and, you know, service locator versus dependency injection framework, all that stuff. I think that's noise. I think for most people, it doesn't matter and we don't care, but understanding like why it's good to like pass dependencies in, kind of invert the control, uh, why it's good to not just create everything on the fly. I think those are the types of things that are really beneficial. Um, how dependency injection can maybe help uh, testing as well. Um, and then knowing a framework that helps with that. Um, don't even necessarily have to know it well, like Dagger, like I am not a Dagger expert, but I can, you know, I can see Dagger, I can make Dagger work for me, but I'm not an expert. But I understand why we use it and I understand the benefits that come from that. So I think that would be kind of maybe like another next level after that. To kind of just like wrap this up, you know, how do you stay up to date? Uh, just kind of three points here throughout. Don't try and learn everything all at once. You can't know it all. Uh, one person will never know it all. So it's very okay to focus on the things you need and the things you're interested in. If you really need to go deep and learn something, you can do that at the time that you need it, whether that's for a personal project or a, a project at work. Those are the best times to really invest a lot of that time and energy. And then finally, don't be afraid to carve out some time in your schedule to learn things specifically because they just interest you or excite you. They don't all have to be uh, going through and checking off lists on a to-do list or a list out there that you might've found that say, you know, these are the things you need to learn to be an Android developer or be a web developer. You know, you have freedom in there to play with and learn the things that excite you as well. And I think, it, you know, if we can try and do that, it, it can help us um, not, not stay up to date on everything, but to be able to continue to stay current and be refreshing our skills as we go.